Um, today, I'm joined by my good friend and colleague here, Cameron Wetton. Cameron, how's it going? Good. Great to be here, Nigel. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Cam. Um, Cam is one of the application engineers here on our team who works primarily in the post-sales department um, on a lot of our automation projects. So I know, uh, Cameron, you're working on some pretty robust automation projects that are, uh, they got you locked up in your room there for uh, the next couple of months. So yeah. uh, it's definitely good to talk to you every once in a while. <laughs> um, and today we're going to go over uh, something in Inventor that I think is really important and kind of uh, takes some of people's modeling to that next level, right? We can all, you know, make sketches, we can all do extrudes, um, but oftentimes people try to stay away from things like sweeps um, and adaptive features as well, um, strictly because sometimes you get a bunch of errors um, and you, you know, just sometimes for me, especially when I started using it, it was really frustrating. Um, but once, you know, you kind of get all of those intricacies down, it makes it a lot easier. And there's a lot of really useful applications um, for some of these more advanced modeling methods. And uh, that's what Cameron's here to show us today. I know Cameron will go a little bit more in depth as to what the applications are um, and, you know, some of those intricacies, like I talked about, um, to be able to do all of this without getting errors. Um, I know that there's a couple that are very famous in my mind. And... Uh, so on and so forth. But uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the, uh, the chat panel as well. And we'll go ahead and address those either during the session if we have some time or at the end of the session during our dedicated Q&A. Um, but with that, I think that's everything I needed to introduce, Cameron. Um, did you have anything else to add before we get started? Uh, that's great. Cool, let's, uh, let's go through it. Okay, great, thanks, Nigel. Yeah, so, like I said, today we're going to go over adaptive cables, tubes, and uh, other sweep features in Inventor. Now, just as a review, a sweep feature, a sweep is a feature that creates 3D geometry by pushing a two-dimensional profile along a path. And the, the key feature, the key idea of a sweep is that it maintains a constant cross-section along the entire path. Now, an adaptive sweep is one whose path is controlled by geometry of other entities so that when those entities change, the sweep's path changes to adapt. And uh, here are, are a couple of examples uh, of geometry that can be created as sweeps. Other examples would include like rigid and flexible electrical conduit, hydraulic and pneumatic hoses, uh, any hanging ropes and cables, etc. Adding adaptivity to the sweeps gives them the power to update themselves as the overall design changes. For example, a belt passing over a series of pulleys and idlers can adjust itself if the pulley's positions are changed. This saves valuable time over manually adjusting the belt geometry each time. Um, so today we're going to take a look at three examples that will illustrate the fundamental concepts of using adaptivity in 2D and 3D sweeps We'll look at controlling the sweep geometry as much or as little as needed. And also finally working with three-dimensional splines through the two-dimensional interface of your monitor and mouse. It could be a little challenging at times to kind of manipulate that geometry. So I'll show you some techniques um, for getting through that. So without further ado, let's switch over to Inventor and uh, go through our first example. So here we've got um, like a piping system. We've just shown the, the relevant sections of it, but let's say we've got a piece, a section of piping that's going this direction and another section of piping that's going this direction. And as I rotate the view, you'll see, you know, they're not in the same plane. Uh, and we want to run a flexible hose from the one pipe run over to the other pipe run. And uh, like I said, because they're not in the same plane, we're gonna need, that's gonna be a three-dimensional curve that we're going to follow there. So we're going to want to create a 3D sweep to get to that point. And we're also going to want to make it adaptive just in case in either of these pipe runs needs to shift its position, then we don't, you know, the, the, the hose itself is going to adapt itself to make sure that it's connected at each end, no matter what. And all right, so let's, uh, let's, let's get started here. So the first thing I want to do is I've got a couple of fittings um, I've got a connection on each of the pipe runs, but I need to actually have a connection from my hose as well. So I'm going to go ahead and just constrain. I've got a couple hose fittings that I've placed here to use. 
and we'll just constrain this one over here. We'll just throw an insert constraint on that. That's good enough for now. At this point, not too concerned about the rotational degree of freedom that's remaining. We should be fine without worrying about that. Okay, so now I've got a couple of host fittings that we can connect with. And so you'll see, uh, it's like a cam and groove style connection there. And then this is a, a shank that the hose would actually fit over. And then you clamp it down um, to make sure the hose stays on the fitting. And so what we're gonna do here, um, in order to make this adaptive, we wanna go ahead and start creating this hose, the piece of the hose in place. So we'll use this create component in place command. And I'm just gonna call this, uh, work and then I want I, I do want to constrain the sketch plane to the selected facer plane and I'll show you what that means here in a second so I'll hit okay and what I want to do is I want to pick uh, basically where my hose is going to start is going to be on this face it'll start here and then there'll be a straight section here and then it'll basically have a 3d spline going over to here and then another straight section then it'll end up on that face there so this is the face I'm going to start on. So that's the one I'll pick to constrain my part two. So it creates the hose part and places it. And the constraint option actually creates a constraint. Um, if I switch over to assembly, that's not going to do that. So let me just return it back up so you can see it's actually created a flush constraint between this new parts uh, XY plane and that face that I chose. Okay, so now that the that'll be sure to stay constrained. Now, the idea is, uh, again, we're gonna create a, a, a 3D sweep. So the first sweep, or sweeps rely on two things. First, you have to have a path and you have to uh, or have a profile. So first of all, let's uh, create our profile, which will be just the 2D cross section of what our, our hose is gonna be. And since it's gonna start here, that's where I'm gonna place my, uh, my path. So I'm going to start the 2D sketch command. And because of the plane that I chose to start the face that I started the part on, I'm going to go ahead and grab that XY plane because I know that's constrained to be in the right spot. So I'll go ahead and choose that. And it always tries to change the orientation of the view to look face on to whatever plane you're sketching on, which we're kind of in the assembly environment here. So it kind of throws things off and makes things really throws the view off into a weird place. So before I make any changes to the view to get that back, I'll just hit F5 to return to my previous view. And it got me kind of close. There we go. Well, you know, we'll make more use of that later, you'll see. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do here is I want to project the geometry of this outer edge. So I'm gonna grab that in. And this is where the adaptivity comes in because I'm actually grabbing geometry that doesn't exist in this part file that I'm working in, right? This hose fitting exists in the assembly that's in the level above. And so when I project that edge in, it creates an adaptive link between this hose part and the assembly. Okay, so I've got that. Now that I don't, my hose isn't gonna be that big. So I'm not gonna use that as my profile. So I'm gonna turn that into construction geometry. And then I'm going to create a circle for the actual hose outside diameter. And I do need an inside diameter. So I'm going to go ahead and project this edge from the outside of that shank diameter. So that'll be my inside edge of the, the hose. And then I'll just give that a thickness here. Okay, so now I've got my profile. So we'll go ahead and finish that sketch. Now for the path, like I said, we're going to create a, a 3D sketch. So I'll go ahead and start my 3D sketch command. And uh, this first part is going to be a straight section uh, from here to there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and include geometry. And that'll bring in the geometry from, again, from that uh, fitting. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do the same thing over here. Now. You might have noticed this looks a little bit different. And yeah, there's an issue with what I'm doing here, but I'm gonna do it wrong first so I can show you what, what can go wrong. And then we'll come back and fix it and do it in a way that'll work. But so I'm gonna create my first section here by picking on that point and that point. So there's my straight section. I'm just going a little slow on me today here. 
Come on. There we go. Okay, so there's my two straight sections of my spline. Now I'm gonna go ahead and create the spline here. And I'll just pick the, my first point there. I'm gonna have one intermediate point so I can control the curve of the spline. And then make sure I grab that point there. Hit create. And okay, that'll place my spline. We'll go ahead and, I'll just gonna go through, I'll come back and go through this in more detail once I demonstrate why the, what I'm particularly doing now isn't quite right. So that's good enough for now. It's a little, not quite natural looking, but that's okay. We'll come back and revisit that. So, <clears throat> all right. So I'm gonna back out of this. I got my sketch. I'm not gonna create the sweep yet because I'm gonna show you what's gonna go wrong with this sketch. So you'll notice this is adaptive here, but this 3D sketch doesn't show the adaptivity symbol next to it. Um, and that's gonna be the root of the issue. So if I come back up to my assembly and we adjust the position of this subassembly. Let's just say we, let's just push it out. Instead of 40, we'll make it 48. You'll see the issue there. My 3D sketch has not adaptively adjusted to the position of that fitting. Okay. All right, I'm gonna undo that constraint. And then we'll come back into our hose and take a look at what's going on here. So in this 3D sketch, when we projected it in, and you, and you can kind of get a hint from the coloration that's going on of the sketch entities here. When I projected these entities in, they came in as green and they created an adaptive link with the uh, hose fitting. But when I projected in the 3D sketch, they came in as blue. And if I take a look at my, turn on my constraint glyphs, you'll see the difference here. That's a projected geometry glyph there. But this, when it comes in, doesn't come in as projected geometry. It just comes in, it just drops a circle into the 3D space and then it locks it in place with lock fixed constraints. And so that basically means those can't move. So even if the geometry moves, they stay in place. So that's definitely not what we want, right? So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna delete this 3D sketch and we're gonna do something a little bit different. So th the main problem is here that 3D sketches uh, don't really work with adaptivity, um, but 2D sketches do work with adaptivity. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take advantage of the adaptability of 2D sketches to bring in the geometry that we need to have that needs to be adaptive, and then we'll connect between those with the 3D sketch. And the easiest way to do that is to just, by doing what we did with this first uh, profile sketch, is we're just gonna start a 2D sketch um, in the at the relevant point. So we need a, basically a point here that our spline can pass through. We need a point here at the end of this fitting and a point here at the back of this fitting. And the easiest way to get those is to just start a sketch on that face when I do that, again, it's just a view. I'll hit F5 to get back to the view I was on. And then you'll see it actually does a couple things for us here. It creates this work plane that is uh, adaptively constrained to the end of that fitting. And now when I project the geometry of this curve here, it's going to bring in an adaptive reference to that fitting just like before. And now I've got the point that I can work through and this is all adaptive. Okay. So that's all I need for that sketch. So I'll just finish that. I'll start a new 2D sketch over here, do the exact same thing at this end. Hit F5 to get my view back, project the geometry, and we're done there. Finish sketch, start a sketch there, project our geometry, and there we go. So now we've got all the entities we need, and they're all adaptive, ready for our 3D sketch. So now we'll go ahead and start the 3D sketch. Create our straight line elements between those points. And then we'll grab our spline again. Now I like to use, there's two different types of splines you can create. Uh, for this sort of thing, I like to use the interpolation spline because it, it places a vertex. Anywhere you place an intermediate point is a point where the spline must pass through. And I find it's a lot easier to control the path of my spline that way um, than the control vertex. And so that's what I'm gonna be, that's what I typically use for this sort of situation. Now I'm gonna put one intermediate point just like before. And it, I don't really care where it ends up at first because I can adjust it later. And then I just need to make sure it gets connected there. 
And then we need to make sure that this comes off tangent. We don't want our hose isn't going to come out and kink off the direction straight off the bat. So we want to add a tangent constraint between here and here. And then come over here and add a tangent constraint between here and there. But you do have to be careful. You have to want to look at the direction that's actually going to start with. Because if this, sometimes it might default to going off this direction and swinging back. And if you create the tangent constraint at that point, then it's going to tangent this way instead of this way, which is not what we want. In this case, it's a little, I think it's probably fine. Um, but if you're, if it's, if you're not sure, then we can just drag this uh, intermediate point off to the side until it's obvious that we're going to get the right solution. Create our tangent. Okay, so now basically all that's left is just moving this intermediate point until we get about the shape that we want. And this is the part where it gets a little tricky working with a three-dimensional entity in the two-dimensional plane of my screen and with the limitation of my mouse can only move in the x and y directions, right? So um, in the plane of my screen. So sometimes moving stuff around, like this seems to be a little too far this way because my host is kind of coming back this way and then going over. So I would need to bring my, my point further in this direction. But if I'm working in this plane, there's no way to do that. I can only drag it in the other two planes. And so um, what I find the easiest to do is uh, use my view cube to orient to my front and side plane views and um, so that I know that I can at least drag the point in the planes that I need to. So, And then, so I'll get it to look about right in one view. Like, let's say that looks okay in that view. And then I'll check the, the next view here and see if that looks about right. Yeah, that's not too bad. And then just check the top view just to make sure that one looks okay too. So that curve doesn't look too sharp. So that looks pretty good. So um, you could either do that, just eyeball it. Um, usually with flexible things like hoses and cables and stuff, eyeballing it's good enough. You're not trying to get too precise. Um, but in the case where you might need some more control over this, um, you can certainly add some constraints. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know, the idea is you could you could move this up and down if you needed a little more slack in your hose, then it's going to tend to droop down a little more and then come back up. Um, and you'll see, this is one of the issues with working this in this uh, two-dimensional workspace as well, is that I, when I try to drag it up and down, it doesn't actually go up and down. For whatever reason, Inventor is limiting me to only being able to drag this point in that direction. But if I change my view, sometimes it's a little better. This view is no better. That's exactly the same. But if I come to the side view, then it allows me to drag it up and down. So that becomes a little challenging to maneuver that around. Um, but in the cases where I need to move it and it's not letting me, there's another option. We've got this 3D transform option up here. So you basically select that, uh, start that command, click that point, and then it gives us some arrows that we can drag it around in either direction of this plane. And then if I need to adjust it in the other plane, I can just keep the command active, switch to my other view, and then the commands or the, yeah, the controls flip to work in this plane instead. So if you find that adventures for whatever reason, sometimes it does limit you, sometimes it doesn't. And it's just, I haven't really found any kind of sense to when it does and when it doesn't. Um, if you find that it's doing that to you, then go to the 3D transform command and it'll let you drag stuff around. So you could put a little more slack into your line if you need to, or if you want to make sure there's no low points in your line, then you'll definitely want to remove that slack and make sure it's a little bit of a tighter, tighter fit like that. All right, so let's call that good. And there's our, our path is done. Let's go ahead and finish that sketch. And once that's Okay, that's done. Inventor's going a little slow on me today. So here's, we're gonna start, create our sweet feature. And then we have to choose our profile, which is right there. And then our path, which is right there. So there's our hose. I'm gonna darken that so we can see it easier. Okay, so there's our hose. Now let's test the adaptivity by adjusting the position of this assembly here. Now, if I move this out to 48, now you'll see the end, the ends stay connected. Okay, 
And it's, you can even change like the angle. I've got a, an angle constraint that I put in here. Like if I change this to, I don't know, let's try 10 degrees. You'll see it even adjusts to fit that angle there. So really cool, really powerful to be able to do that. It would also work if I move this one around, it, it works either way because I've, I've set it to be adaptively constrained on either end, on both ends. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that there are limitations to how much this thing can move um, before the sweep feature will fail or the maybe the 3D sketch path will fail. There are definitely things that can go wrong. If I you know push this way out you know, over here, then the, you've got to keep in mind that it's always got to pass through that point the, that intermediate point that we created. And that intermediate point is not constrained to anything. It's not adaptively set to follow anything. It's always gonna stay in that spot relative to the origin of its part. And so um, if we move this way over here, then the hose has got to come down, pass through that point, and then move, try and make its way back to wherever this end connection happens to be. And if that forces the, the sweep path to go through such a sharp curve that it can't compute, then it's gonna fail. Um, or you also have to watch out for any place where you have tangencies. Remember we added those tangent constraints at each end of the spline. There are two possible solutions to the tangency. It can either come out the way we have it now or it could flip around and be tangent the other direction. And so sometimes drastic changes, like if I were to move this way over here, there's a possibility, it doesn't always, but there's a possibility that it could solve that tangent constraint the other way. And then instead of coming out and tangenting up, it would come out and tangent back, which the sweep path is not going to be able to solve that. So your sweep feature will fail. So you do have to keep in mind the limitations of the sweep features of the, the 3D sketch path of any constraints that you've put in place. Um, but it is, you know, pretty, you know, as long as you're not making gigantic changes and it's, it's pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and let's see if we can force a, failure so you can see what I'm talking about. So right now that's set at negative 42 inches from that plane. If I were to just set it to be instead of negative 42, I just make it 42. That's going to flip it over to the other side. And there we go. We've got a failure. So yeah, because it's trying to, again, go through that inter intermediate point that's still over here and then swing back and come back in. So let's take a look at that. So the sweep feature for sure has failed. It's possible that the 2D sketches or the 3D sketches failed. But the 3D sketch path is fine. It's fine to just do that. It doesn't have any failure there, but the sweep feature is having to go around this sh kind of sharp curve here, which I'm guessing is just too sharp for that, uh, for that profile to make that curve without crossing in onto itself. And so that's why it's failing. Um, now you could just, if you needed it to be here, you could just adjust where this intermediate point is. Um, maybe adjust the angle of this so that it's pointing in a more natural direction, or if that's not an option, just adjust this so that that sweep um, profile or that sweep path can make its curve around without crossing over itself. See if that was good enough. So yeah, there you go. That was good enough there. So again, just it's always a good idea to keep in mind what the limitations are going to be, what the range of motion you're going to need to account for is, you know, how, how different can these positions of these two entities be? from each other, um, all things to keep in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that intermediate point, like I said, is not constrained. There's nothing controlling that. So it's just gonna, there's nothing that's gonna move. It'll stay there until we tell it to do otherwise, either manually by coming in here and dragging it like we did, or you could try to add some constraints um, or some dimensions or even, uh, yes, yeah, so like parameters to control its location. Like if you had a, a parameter that tells you how high this is supposed to be, you could say this is always supposed to be at two thirds of that height or, or something like that. Um, or if you want to continue to use adaptivity, one method you could do um, is uh, take advantage of these 2D sketches like we've got. And let me show you what I mean. I'll, I'll start a 2D sketch on this plane and then I'll project the work point from there and there. Let's see, it's dropping those onto that plane, which I don't really care what, where the plane is. What I'm going for here is I wanna grab a reference dimension from there to there. Let's make sure it's gonna be vertical. And this is complaining because it's over constraining, but I, that's what I want. I want a, a reference dimension there. So. 
So that's going to change as those points move closer and further away from each other. And so now what I can do is um, go back into my 3D sketch. Come on. And now I can actually add a dimension from uh, this point here up to this plane and say, uh, that's always going to be some factor of that other reference dimension. I didn't know what the D7. So that's going to be D7 times 0.6 or something like that, like kind of two thirds of the way. And then of course you could do the same thing for, I've done it for the Y direction here. You could do the same for the X and the Z directions to you know, give them some kind of formula that controls them based on the other geometry. And so now, if I move this unit uh, vertically, if I change its position, let's drop that down to negative 80. Hopefully that's not too far. There we go. You'll see that that intermediate point adjusted because that reference, uh, it, it changed the position of this geometry, which changed the value of this reference dimension, which then changed the value of the location of that intermediate point. So you can see it. Okay, so that's one way to just use adaptive geometry without having to resort to parameterizing everything. Sometimes parameterizing is a good way to go. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Um, so this is another option. All right. Let's take a look at our next example. Here, uh, I've got this frame with a, a panel here, then an instrument over here, and I need to run a tube or a cable from this panel over to that instrument, but I want it to follow along the path of this frame. And in fact, I've even got little clamps um, that are going to be holding that tube in place um, at specific points on the frame. And so I want to be able to route that through those tubes to get to this point over here. And so we're going to follow basically the same concepts as what we did before, but instead of just a single intermediate point going from, you know, a loose tube from one end to the other. We have to go through these intermediate points. We start the same way. We create a component in place. And I've already done that here just to kind of save us some time. But I basically started it on this face here. So it's constrained to the side of the panel. If we go into there, again, the idea is we'll start the same way. We'll create 2D sketches to bring in this geometry and this geometry to make sure that those are adaptive. And then we do the same thing on the other end here. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so I'll start my 2D sketch command. Start there, hit F5 to get my view back. Project geometry, that's what we need. And then, come on, oh, 2D sketch. And then we'll start another 2D sketch on this back plan. I think that's actually where I started the Part. So rather than if I click, the, I, I could totally just click that back face again, um, but it's going to create another work plane when I've already got one there. My origin plane should already be at that point. Let's just double check. Yeah. Oh, no, that's on the face. Of the, oops, that's the wrong plane. There we go. Side view. Here we go. Oh, no, looks like I did it on the front face. So I just duplicated a plane. Oh, well. But so instead of duplicating a plane, you could just sketch on the, the origin plane that was already there. But yeah, we'll, we'll just keep going. OK, so now I'll click on the back face, uh, start a sketch there, get my view back, project that geometry, finish sketch, then do the same thing down here. Sketch there. Project, finish your sketch. Okay. And then we're gonna basically do the same thing where we've got some straight sections here and, and at the other end, and then we're gonna do a spline section. But in this case where we need to pass through those intermediate points, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, we're gonna do the same thing here, project, uh, start a sketch on this face, project that edge, start a, start a sketch on this face, project that edge to make sure we're adaptive to this component. So let's go ahead and start that.
All right, uh, finish our sketch. Okay, and then we would do the same thing all along, but I've already done these ones just to save us some time so you don't have to watch me do that. And okay, so then these are there's gonna be some straight sections along our path between these points and all along here. And you'll see I've already done that as well for some of these. And then instead of one giant spline, we're just gonna run intermediate or just splines between each straight section with probably just one intermediate point in between so that we can kind of give it a wavy look and uh, kind of control its shape that way. So let's go ahead and do that. I've already got my 3D sketch that I've started to save us some time, but I need to drag this down here so that uh, it's got reference to these other sketches that I just created. And then we'll go ahead and start our straight section here. And here. And one more here. And then our throw in our spline again, our interpolation again. Make sure it's connected there. And then the intermediate point, uh, I'm not too concerned about where that's at at the moment. I guess I'll move it down there. Right there, make sure you hit create. And then okay. And create our tangent constraints. And then we'll just go through here quickly and connect up these last ones. Going so slow in winter. Oh, okay. I actually clicked something wrong on that one. Let's do that one again. Come on. Ooh, that one's going to be in a weird spot, but that's okay. Adjust it. Yeah, anyway, I think you get the idea. All right, so now we've got those intermediate points. Let's throw in our tangent constraints. We definitely need to make sure those stay tangent. I have to check this one. Okay, that one should be fine. Come on. It's okay. All right, then the last thing we really need to do is just adjust those intermediate points that the tube is going in a sensible direction. This one might be a little low, so if we can drag that up. Look at it from above. Oh yeah, that's sticking way too far out that way. It's not gonna let me drag it though, so let me use my 3D transform. Move that back into a sensible place. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Call that good. This one. It's not too bad as it is. Let's look at it from above. Yeah, that looks fine. This one's a little odd. Not quite right. So we wanna make sure it doesn't interfere with our leg there. Might be a little too low. Okay, we'll call that good. Yeah, some of these are pretty far out there. Oh man, come on. Okay, you get the idea again. All right, so let's, uh, should be now a complete path we can use for a sweep. Grab our profile. Oh, I didn't create a profile. Let's do that. Um, let's go back into that sketch. And that construction, there we go. Sweep. 
there, and there. Make it a little easier to see here. So there you go. So again, you gotta keep in mind that those intermediate points are gonna to tend to stay where they are. Um, so, you know, it's, if the frame changes width, um, depending on how you've constrained these, uh, I've set these so that the, these two are, this one's six inches from the inside of this leg and this one is six inches from the inside of this leg. So as this frame gets wider, you know, this one will stay in position and this one will move across and then the path will update, uh, except for the intermediate point because that's not constrained. So I'll have to either manually adjust that quickly or find some way to constrain that um, or something like that. But uh, that's the main idea there. So if this is what you can do if you want to hit through intermediate points. Um, another option you could do, and so if you didn't necessarily need to care exactly where, uh, like if you didn't have guide points, maybe you're just going to have the guys to cable tie this in the field. But you're not too concerned about exactly hinder, hitting intermediate points. You could instead just do this with all a single spline from here all the way to here, just with a bunch of intermediate points, instead of a big drooping cable down all the way down to there. Um, you could just hit it, put an intermediate point about there, put an intermediate point about there. Let's just do one real quick, just so you can kind of see what I mean. Let's go back into our, oh, gotta go into the part. Into our, let's go into our 3D sketch we've already created since we've got some endpoints to start with. Let's say we, one big spline from here and then maybe hit an intermediate point in a few places just to kind of follow a path all the way down to here and then make it tangent of course oh that one went the wrong way didn't check beforehand Yep, that one's slightly going the other way. So let's drag intermediate point this way, just enough. So it solves the tangent constraint the other way. There we go. So yeah, so now you've got, you can add more intermediate points if you need them, um, or you can just drag them around until they're about the right spot that you'll tell the, you get, get the idea that the cable's being run along the frame, but you're not being too picky about exactly where those points are. You know, if you need to add additional ones, you just right click on the spline and do uh, insert point and then just pick along the point where you want it to be. So you could add one there and then that gives you another control point that you can drag around. So um, so I, I've done that in cases where I didn't have specific points I needed to hit, but I did want, want to show it following along a certain path that I want the tube to be run. Um, that's a quick way to do that. So just another way to do it. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at our last example, which is gonna be a little bit different than what we've seen so far. Instead of using um, like a swoopy bendy path, it's basically, this is gonna be something that's in tension. Um, like in this case, we've got a cable running through several sheaves, um, but the same concept would apply for a belt running across uh, pulleys and idlers. Um, same idea, just that instead of a, a circular cross section for a cable, it would have you know a rectangular cross section or like a V-belt shaped cross section for, for a belt. And the idea here is um, where we've got all these in a single plane, instead of using a 3D sketch, I've just used a 2D sketch to build this path. I've already got one here just so you can see it. So what we'll, let's go ahead and build one. So I'll turn the visibility of this guy off. And I'll show you how I built this one, which is using similar concepts before, but it's slightly different. So we'll create our part in place. Uh, let's just call this uh, cable three. Yeah, I've got a few already. We'll start it there. And uh, we are gonna be doing a sweep. So we need a, both a, a profile and a path. So let's go ahead and do our path. And we'll, we sketched on that plane or we started our part on that plane there. So we'll go ahead and sketch on that plane. So I don't duplicate my plane like I did last time. 
and then project that in. That gives us our adaptive geometry to the assembly entity. And uh, let's put our path in there. Oh, that is not constrained. Oh, I missed the point. Coincident constraint there. Turn that so it's not, uh, so it's construction geometry. So there's our profile. And you know what? I don't think I want my profile there because this is going to come out. And it's going to go straight from there down to here. So that's going to have a sharp angled bend right at that point, which you wouldn't have in real life. But for the purposes of this demonstration, it would be fine. It's just if the path is there, that might cause some issues figuring out what the what it's going to be. So let's let's delete that instead. Let's create our sketch back here, put our profile there instead. There we go. Okay. Now, um, in order to get the adaptive geometry in, we're going to use the same technique where we start a 2D sketch on the face where we need to point, project the geometry, and that's good. And then over here on our endpoint, let's make sure we grab that. Uh, start a 2D sketch on that face. Project the geometry. And then you could have it go on if you want to. I don't really care to in this case, in this example. All right. So we've got our start and our endpoints, but now we want to be able to have it wrap around these sheaves and it, for it to be adapted. So if these sheaves move, then the path will adapt itself. Um, so in this case, the way these sheaves are modeled, I've got, uh, it's kind of got this, this little raceway for where the cable goes through. You can see it there. And this, uh, the center line of, so the cable when it's bottomed out is gonna be here, but the center, the center line of the cable is gonna be running along about up here somewhere. And I've, the way I've modeled these, this surface here, this cylindrical diameter is at the, the center point of where the cable would be for a cable of this size. And so I've got already got the geometry that I need. I can just project this circular edge into my sketch and that's gonna give me the point where my uh, uh, cable center line is gonna pass through. So that's where my path will go. Um, if your sheaves or, or whatever geometry you're trying to adapt to doesn't already have the geometry you need, you'll have to do something different. Either add some geometry to the parts if you can. Um, if you can't, you'll have to get clever <laughs> with parameters or something to make sure you end up, because you wanna make sure the path is the center line. We don't wanna have the the path hit this bottom point here because that's not the center line of the, the cable. So if I run my, if I run our sweep and our profile goes through, that'll put the cable down inside the, the race of the sheave there. So we don't want to do that. Um, you want to keep in mind that you're working with the center line. All right, let's go back into our part. And okay, so like I said, th in this case, these all these sheaves are in a plane. Um, so I can get away with doing a 2D sketch instead of a 3D sketch. Um, and that's gonna be on this plane there. And so I can just directly project in the geometry that I need and it's gonna come in as adaptive. Where we couldn't do that with a 3D sketch, we had to make use of uh, like intermediate 2D sketches to bring our adaptivity in. But that's already got what I need. Let's go ahead and make all those construction so they don't interfere with inventor figuring out where the path is. And then let's start running our, our lines. So we're gonna have a little straight section here just to connect to our, our profile. Oh, I've got to project that point in. Uh, I've actually got to project both of these points in because uh, with a 2D or a 3D sketch, it can already get access to parts or geometry that's in the same part. But for a 2D sketch, it doesn't do that. I have to project the geometry from these other sketch entities and you'll see it brings in the little point entity. There we go. Now I've got something I can attach these lines to. All right, now down here, we just wanna go down here. And one thing you wanna watch out for here is where inventor's gonna try and infer constraints. Some of them are good, like this inference, the tangent, that's a constraint we wanna create, so that would be fine. So you can go ahead and let inventor infer that, but you do want to watch out. See that where it's snapping to that point there? It wants to create a coincident constraint there, which is definitely not what we want, which I think I'm pretty sure that's just a quadrant. So you like that. If you go around, you'll see there's four points that it tries to snap to. 
So just keep that in mind to make sure you're not clicking on that. So either click away from a point you know for sure is not going to be the quadrant, it's not going to infer that, or you can try and get that tangent and straight to infer. Just be careful if that tangent's near the quadrant, who knows what you get if you click on it. So um, I just find it easier just to click some point you know for sure is not going to infer anything. And then we can come back in and add the tangent constraints later. I mean, I guess it's not the end of the world. If it does infer something you don't want, you can always go back in and delete the inferred constraint. Um, but if you don't notice it, then it might cause you some headache. Okay, so it looks like I did infer a couple of those tangent constraints. I'm gonna turn on my constraints so I can see which ones still need tangents. This one's, this one here is good, but I do need one here. And I do need one here. There, I got that one. Okay, so that part of the path is fully constrained. All we have left to do is just fill in these little arcs. And so I'm gonna use a circular arc. I'm gonna use a center point arc. That makes the most sense since I've already got a projected center point. And we just connect those. Again, making sure that being careful you it's inferring the constraints that you want. You don't want to end up with an arc that's got a broken path, an incomplete, an open loop, if you will. So that happens quite a lot with arcs. I'm just dragging these to make sure. A lot of times arcs will constrain at the center and the first point you pick, but a lot of times not at the second point you pick. Looks like in this case, it's actually done both. So I just, to test that, I just grab the arc and drag it. And if it's not constrained, the unconstrained end will kind of move around, so. That looks good. All right, so we've got our path. Let's go ahead and create our sweep with our profile and our path. And like I said, there's gonna be that sharp corner there, but it's fine for this demo. But you'd obviously wanna do something different in a real scenario. Let's turn up the contrast on this. There we go. So there's our path. There's our, our cable that's passing through our sheaves. And now um, I've got some parameters that are set up uh, for the X and Y locations of each of these sheaves. So let's just uh, adjust these. Let's, uh, let's see, that's the Y direction of the second one. Let's push that up a little bit. Let's push that to 18. And that moves around. Let's adjust the X. Uh, 15. There you go. So now you've got a little more control over your components and the, the cables will adaptively adjust, cable or belt or whatever it is that's going through here. Um, again, always keep in mind the limitations. If you push these too far, then things weird things happen. Um, your sketch could break or it could do weird stuff. Like let's say if I push this one up above so it's no longer passing underneath, it wouldn't really be touching anymore, but we've still told it to be contangent, so it does weird stuff. Let's see, that's the sheet three Y. Let's push that up, 18, that's still good. You still see there's a little bit of a, an arc there. Let's push that to 19, uh, that's still good, 21. Ooh, barely, it's barely touching it. So if we push beyond that, we know for sure that's gonna, do weird things. Okay, so it looks like it's, I mean, we told it to be tangent and it's, you know, obeying that constraint, but uh, it's kind of hard to tell with my wireframe view here. If I turn the shaded view back on, you'll see it's actually, it's staying tangent, but now instead of the arc being a little piece here, it's wrapping all the way around. So that's obviously bad. So it didn't fail, but it's obviously giving us a bad result. So you just want to keep that stuff in mind. Sometimes if you push it beyond, um, the limit and try to go back. Inventor won't solve things the way you want them to. So if I bring this back, it might not resolve that back to something good. But in this case, it looks like it did. So we lucked out on that one, but sometimes you're not so lucky. Um, make sure there's anything else I wanted to cover here. No, I think that's it. So, I mean, obviously, like I said, this applies to not just cables, but you could do uh, ropes or you could do belts, uh, conveyor belts, that sort of thing. 
um, anything that needs to follow a path that has to adjust to other entities that are not a part of the, the, the part that the path is in, that the, the sweep is in. So um, I think that was all I wanted to cover. Let's, uh, let's see if we've got any questions. Looks like we've got one from Jeffrey. It says, are those flex hose connections you used in the demo in Inventor's Content Center? Uh, I think you're talking about these cam and groove fittings. No, I, these are not in Content Center. These are ones that I developed myself. Um, I did end up adding them to Content Center as a Content Center family, but they were custom ones I had to create myself. Hey, can you hear me okay, Kim? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. I just had to adjust my microphone there. Um, so yeah, that's the first question that you took care of. Um, let's jump to the second question. Um, is it possible to limit the length of the 3D sketch to round numbers? Uh, yes, it is. That's a great question. Uh, let me open up this one. Well, I want to let me open it up in context here. We'll go into our spline, our 3D sketch. Um, there are ways to control the spline length. Um, maybe that's only for tube and pipe. Now you can adjust the tension, which affects the length, but that's not really giving you a value that is directly related to length. There is an option for that, but I'm, I think that's actually specifically if you're building a flexible hose inside of the tube and pipe environment, it has an option. It's, if you've never used that before, it's kind of similar to this, although some of this is a, it's a lot easier to do. It's a little more automated in that you, you choose a fitting, you tell it where to connect, it'll automatically connect the fitting at one end, connect the fitting at the other end, and then it runs a hose in between. And you can add intermediate points to control the path, but then it's also got a control to set the hose length. So you can either have it not be fixed or you can tell it, I want this to be a fixed length at 18 inches or, or whatever. And um, it'll adjust the spline tension so that it stays at that length, um, which is a great feature for, for running hoses, but that, that's specifically only available in the tube and pipe module, um, which is another definitely another way to run hoses. I just wanted to show this method is a different way of doing it. Um, if you don't want to, you know, if you're just creating one one-off hose, sometimes the tube and pipe module is a lot more overhead. There's a lot more setup required to get the tube and pipe module to, to do what you need it to do. And sometimes it's just not worth setting all that up for just one little piece of hose or, or cable or whatever. So um, that's why this, that's where situations like that is where this method comes in handy. In uh, the bill materials cam, does the pipe length or the, the tube length show? No, nope, it doesn't. That's something um, I've, in the past, I've written like a little iLogic rule that um, I can tell it the name of a 3D sketch and it'll measure the length of a path. Maybe that's something we can cover in a future AVA. Um, so that, and then I've set the iLogic rule to trigger, have an event trigger that when, you know, the part geometry changes, it'll run that rule. So anytime the, the part changes, it automatically refreshes that, that parameter that stores the length that's measured from the path. And then you can pull that path length into the description in your bill of materials or yeah. have it be its own column. Um, does it matter which section you start and end the straight sections? I guess when you're adding those like intermediate sections. Um, as far as like whether you're... I don't think so. Like whether you start from the beginning or the end and move like go forward or go backwards on the path. I've never um, seen that affect anything. So I, in general, I would say no. There might be weird niche cases where that might come into play, but I've never run into a case like that. Um, I mean, just from my own brain, logically, I just tend to go from one end to the other, but I, I guess I don't always stick to that. Sometimes I might pick here first and go to there. Yep. But I haven't seen that affect anything. Um, can you add intermediate points to an existing spline? Mm -hmm. Yep. You just uh, make sure you select the spline, right click on it, and then hit insert point. 
it doesn't insert it when you hit that, it, then it kind of starts an insert point command. Then you have to go through and pick a specific point along the line where you want the point and it drops it in there. Then you can adjust it from there. Yep. Cool. And you can delete uh, it too. If you have a point that you don't need, you right click on it and delete and it'll readjust itself. Yep. Yeah. You just need to be in the context of a sketch. It's like the same thing as adding geometry to a sketch. Um, you just go back into the sketch itself. So this is all coming from the sketch. Um, yeah. You can go into the sketch and do whatever you want. Um, change the profile, add points, move stuff around, delete sections, add sections. Um, it's all just in the context of working in a sketch. So yeah. I think that I think a lot of us are very familiar with being in here, sometimes banging our heads against the wall. Um, that's a different problem entirely. <laughs> all right. Uh, will this work with different fitting ends, such as hydraulic fittings as well? Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, absolutely. You can use any type of fitting. Um, Almost any type of fitting you're going to need is going to have some like straight section like this. Uh, and so you'll want to find a point where you can, you know, start your first sketch so you can grab that center point, start your second sketch to grab the second center point. And then you've got your starting point that gives you, you always want to put like that tangent constraint on there to control the direction that the spline comes out. Because you don't want that to be loose. Um, otherwise you get, you know, your hoses like with a sharp bend right there coming off in weird directions. But yep. pretty much any fitting I've ever needed has got some geometry I can use for that. Yep. And Rodney's asking if you could share the iLogic rule um, to get the path as a custom property. I don't think you have that ready, Cam, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't have that ready. I, it's not something I thought of to present here. Um, we can tell you what, we can do like a, a blog post and put that uh, iLogic rule up on our website. Um, give me some time to put that together, maybe check back. Uh, next month or something and, and see. Uh, we'll, we'll put that up so you can see it. It's it's not complicated. It's just a pretty simple rule, but uh, um, it's got some calls to the API that if you're not familiar with that sort of thing might be hard to dig up on your own. Yep, and then there's another question from Bruce. Is there a way to create a NURBS path first directly? Um, Possibly, I've never needed to do that, so I don't know. I've not tried. Um, I've always just been able to use either a 2D or a 3D sketch for the path and then use the sweep command to create the geometry for me. Um, yeah, so I don't know, <laughs> maybe, but I've, I've never needed that. All right. Um, I think that's everything for questions. Um, I know there, there's a couple of people asking about recordings of this. Yeah, so it's being recorded right now. Uh, once our marketing team gets a hold of the recording and does some, uh, some editing to the video, they'll upload it to our YouTube channel. So that should happen sometime in the next week or so. So if you want to go ahead and review this, um, go ahead and take a look sometime in the next week. Um, but I think that's everything for questions. Uh, Cam, again, thank you so much for joining us Great. this morning. Uh, really enjoyed the session. I'm sure a lot of people saw it as, uh, as useful as I did. Great. Glad to be here. Cool. Thanks again. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, next week, we've got Thanksgiving, so uh, we will not be hosting an AVA, but uh, we will be sharing our, um, our holiday schedule moving forward. I know that you know Christmas and New Year sometimes pops up in the middle of the week, um, and AVA is not the, you know, it doesn't take precedence over turkey dinner. So <laughs> we will see you all in two weeks. Thanks again, everybody. And thanks again, Cam. We'll talk to you soon.